I mean, no one plans to get sick. And yet, here we are. My name is Matthew Zachary. A quarter century ago, I was given six months to live with a diagnosis of terminal brain cancer. For more than 15 years, I've been ranting and raving on the air about stupid cancer and now stupid healthcare. And I'm just getting warmed up. So let's all go make healthcare suck less together because you know what? We're all out of patience. Hey, that's the name of the show. Hey, friends, welcome back to the show. Got a good one for you today. Gene Gurkoff. He's one thing I am and one thing I'm not a Jewish marathoner. I'll let you guys decide which one is which. He's the founder of a company called Charity Miles. They allow companies to engage their employees to raise money for very specific charities. The fundamental value of Charity Miles is that it helps you invest in building a culture that values health, empathy, and giving back. He's a recovering attorney who got into this world because his grandfather had Parkinson's. He helped kick off Team Fox at the Michael J. Fox Foundation. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Gene Gurkhoff. All right, Gene, welcome to Out of Patience. Am I your first person in real life that you've done a show with? Well, I've done lots of real in-life shows, but never in a studio. Okay, I will accept it. I do podcasts in person, but I do them on a walk or a run. Okay. And I have like a tiny little handheld recorder, which is nowhere nearly as sophisticated as this room that we're in but, right I mean, now with a thirty thirty thousand dollar box. I've got like an eighty dollar handheld hey, recorder. Hey, life hacks, you know. It's kind of a combination of who's saying what, how you sound, and then what you're saying. I think that we have people that say interesting things. We probably just don't sound that good compared to what's going on right well, now. Well, I'll pledge right here on the air to pump you up. Okay. okay. Give you a punch up, as they say in the comedy world. Okay. Punch yeah. up. Okay. So I want to start by saying you're Jewish and athletic. Well, how does I'm that happen? I'm definitely Jewish. Uh, <laughs> Dude, you run marathons. You did an Ironman. I, was I, I participate. I'm not Explain winning the races. Me. What is the difference in participate? What, did you just cursory watch it like the folks on the Paris to car rally when the car flies by? No, I, I do the marathons. I haven't done an Ironman in quite a while. Which means you have done them. I have done okay. six Ironman. Only six. Okay. My last one was in 2012. I don't bike anymore because I've been into bike accidents, but I'd love to run. I love to be active. I like to be outside. Yeah, I grew up playing sports like most kids play sports. And when I got into law school and started running and I just like it, it's a, it's a good way of life. It's, it makes me feel good to be outside. I'm not like winning any races or anything like that, but yeah, I participate. I get a lot of participation medals. <laughs> it's like the gay fucker wall of fourth place basket weaving. Yeah, pretty much. Fantastic. I'm not athletic. I've been very open about yeah. that. I'm a relatively dormant human being. <laughs> well, we can change that. I feel like the end of Rocky Four. If I could change. You can change. You can change. Yeah, exactly. We all can change. Well, you know, maybe that's something to talk about for a second. Like, you know, this is obviously a show about health and probably the number one thing that you can do for your health is to just walk more. And that's Wait, like a, what's that word again? Walk. Walking. And you live you live walk. Yeah. Okay. It's an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure. And just walking more is probably the number one thing that you can do to decrease your risk of almost every major disease. That I understand. I mean having worked in cancer advocacy, I don't really take my own medicine, but I'm right. happy to put people on the platform that says, hey, probably most of you should take your own medicine. Yeah. I mean I mean Twinkies really do taste good though. Come on. They don't taste that good. Well, when you don't eat them for a long time, then you taste them for the first time, they're disgusting. But once you have the first 20, they're really good. Like I am trying to eat a lot healthier and there is a lot of food that I'm like, oh man, I wish it. Just walking down here, like I passed so many different pizza restaurants and- The marshmallow fudge store. Oh, there's so much. There. I'm like, oh, I wish I could have that. But I'm trying store. to take my own medicine, to use your analogy, because I go in and out of shape. Like I'll train for like a big race and I'll get in good shape and then I fall out of shape. So- that's called the Russell Crowe effect. Yeah. So like I'm trying to get back into shape right now. So I'm being very careful about what I eat. And I see all the pizza and fried chicken and everything else that you can eat walking around the city. And I'm like, oh, man, I'd like to have that. But Twinkies, not so much. Well, the magic word is discipline. Yes. I've been learning a lot about this. Like discipline can only get you so far. You have to find like a lifestyle that works for you. Right. And that's what I'm trying to find. I mean, I don't really eat Twinkies. I was just using them as like the worst <laughs> possible yeah. non-nutritional metaphor. Right. But I was reading your story that you were inspired to understand 
some mortality with your grandfather with Parkinson's? Was that your first experience with like, holy shit, things that fall apart at any point? No, I wouldn't say I ever felt that way. I mean, my grandfather was always the mentor in my life, he and my parents. Like, I had a great family growing up and always looked up to my grandfather. And when he had Parkinson's, that kind of became the cause of our family. Like, we're very fortunate that we didn't have other diseases in our family until that point. And that kind of became the cause that we all rallied around. And he got very involved with the Parkinson's Disease Foundation. And I guess I was in college when he got it. And then when I was in law school, I wanted to raise money for the Parkinson's Disease Foundation. And I also wanted to run a marathon. So I decided to put those two together. And I started to run marathons to raise money for Parkinson's research. Was this pre or post Team Fox universe? This is pre Team Fox. So Michael J. Fox had actually just kind of started his foundation a few years. Post Spin City. Yeah, this is post Spin City. So this is like 2001, 2002 is when mm-hmm. I started to run marathons. Michael J. Fox was still young, and my grandfather was on the board of the Parkinson's Disease Foundation. Ah, okay. So that's who I was raising money for. I got involved. He joined. Our family helped raise a lot of money for different projects that they had, and I wanted to raise money. So I started to run marathons for them. How did you get people to give you money, and what platform did you use back then? I collected checks and cash in an envelope and handed it in. Because this is like pre-GoFundMe days. Oh, yeah. This is way before that. Yeah. And still the 2000s, but like right. you think like life back then. like That was still like AOL CD-ROMs and things like that. <laughs> just after that. Right, right. Just after that. Yeah. So when I graduated law school. Harvard Law School. Harvard Law I'll School. throw that in there. You deserve that. <laughs> Thank you. I, I started to see at all these marathons that there was teams for stuff. There was like teams for MS, teams for cancer. Like there was Leukemia Lymphoma Society. I thought there should be a team for Parkinson's. So I asked the Parkinson's Disease Foundation if they wanted to do that. And they said no, because they didn't really see the potential in it. And it was a lot of work. They didn't have the staff for it. But not many charities had that at the time. There was no formal marathon program like there is today. I think we take that for granted these days. Yeah. That there used to not be this thing. Right. And then a friend of my grandfather who was on the board of Michael J. Fox introduced me to... Debbie Brooks, who was the co-founder of the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and I asked her if they would do a Team Fox, and she said, well, we'll think about it, but not at the moment, but they need a legal work done. So I started to do some legal work for them. Are you the reason Team Fox exists, if you trace the cord back to the outlet? One of the I wouldn't first say that. Ideas? I, I'm not the reason that it exists, but I'm definitely one of the founding members of Team Fox. We should lead with that. That's a really, <laughs> that's not on your LinkedIn. That's a really big deal. I want to give you credit for that. Thank you. But there's a lot more people that make it actually happen. Like Michael J. Fox. <laughs> like Michael J. Fox <laughs> and the incredible Bob. people at the foundation, incredible staff. And I just became involved. I did a lot of legal work for them over the years. And I've been an active Team Fox member ever since. I raise money for them every year. So when did you realize that, you know, being a lawyer is a kind of superpower, but you don't really need to channel it every day and there could be other things you could do? Well, my grandfather, the one who had Parkinson's, was a lawyer and then became a business person. So that was kind of what I envisioned for myself as well, that I wasn't going to stay being a lawyer. But I liked being a lawyer. So there's many days that I miss it. I actually really enjoyed being a lawyer. So before we get into the company you're running, Charity Miles, let's talk about what inspired you. What was the spark that I need to do this? Because someone isn't doing it. Well, before Charity Miles, I started another app while I was still practicing law. And it was a public advocacy app called Postcard Petitions, where you could take a picture with your phone and we would mail a postcard of that picture and any message you wanted to your congressman. Wow. That idea came from a few different places. One is... When I was in college, my freshman year in college, I interned for a senator, and we used to get real mail, and I had to answer the real mail. And so I knew that real mail mattered. Real mail. Yeah. And then also around that time, New York State passed a billion-dollar stem cell bill for Parkinson's research Mm. primarily and other things, but it was really important for Parkinson's. And I realized I could never run enough marathons to raise a billion dollars. But if we could improve the advocacy, then you know maybe we could get more government funding for all these diseases that we care about. That idea totally failed. I did everything wrong. I had no idea how to make an app. I hired an agency to build the app for me, spent too much money, and made like every mistake that you could possibly make. I wouldn't say that. The app founder therapy session of the show because I founded two apps as well. Yeah, it's a terrible idea. It's a bad idea. Terrible idea. So then a lot of these charities that I had relationships with that I was working with because of the stuff that I did with Michael J. Fox, I started to do stuff with other charities. They kept asking me for an app if I could help them make an app. And I kept telling them, don't make an app. 
don't make an app. It's a terrible idea. You don't want an app. That's the title for this podcast. Don't, Do not make an yes. app. That is a separate business idea I yeah. have is to just cure people of that notion. But right. they kept asking. And eventually I was in a meeting with a charity and I just had like a thunderbolt moment where it was like, well, if I could take all these charities that want an app and I could be the app that they just plug into so they don't have to build it. And then I could work on the other side, getting the people to walk and run, the companies to come in to support, then that would be... Then there's your revenue model, build sustainability app. Well, that's another story, but we're still well, trying to work out the sustainability part. But, but um, So back in the day, there was a nonprofit called the United Way. Yeah, we work with them. Oh, you do work with them. Because yeah. their original model was, give us your money, we know better. Right. And the modern day version of this is we can actually help you understand where your money goes. And we don't know better. You know better. But here's a way to channel what you want to get done into something that's really important to you. Yeah, they do amazing things. And especially through COVID, we've had the honor of working with them and learning the ways that they channel the funds to the different very local organizations and people that need it through their network. It's an incredible, incredible organization the way they've been set up. All right. So we're going to talk more about app founder therapy and yeah. not being an athlete and <laughs> channeling your legal skills with Gene Gurkhoff right after this. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice-monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. All right, so here we are. We're back, and we want to talk about how this idea of Charity Miles uh, just fomented from this idea of, like, you want an app, and you want an app, and, you know, please don't start an app nonprofit company. It's not worth your time. It's a massive hole in the ocean you keep throwing money into. It skews your donor relations. And I'm speaking, listeners, from experience because I've launched two apps when I was at Stupid Cancer. Don't do it. Yes. But I want to go back to something I read on your blog, which is Fog's. F-O-G-G, Fogg's Behavior Model, which I've yeah. only heard of, but give me the one-on-one. So this is something that I've learned through my course of 10 years of doing Charity Miles. Charity Miles is going to be 10 in June. And again, when I started Charity Miles, I still didn't really know anything despite all the bad mistakes that I made with the previous app. I still had teachable many- Teachable moments. I had many more teachable moments over the ensuing 10 years of Charity Miles. And- Apparently, like one of the books that you should read if you're interested in making any technology that has something to do with behavior is B.J. Fogg, who is kind of like the godfather of persuasive technology and behavior design through technology. He's at Stanford. Uh, he runs, I think it's called the Behavior Design Lab there, although that name might have changed or maybe that's what it changed to. And he has a very simple model that both you can use to either describe when an action is going to take place or hopefully help you think of when an action is going to take place. And so if there's any action that you want, let's say it's walking more. I um, see what you did there. Um, the person will take that action if three conditions are met simultaneously. One is they're sufficiently motivated to do it. The second is that they're able to do it. And the third is, is that they have some trigger or prompt telling them to do it. And it sounds like a very simple thing, but each of those things can be, you know, delved into a lot deeper. And it's something that I've been learning about and I continue to learn about and it influences the way that I think about charity models, but it also influences the way that I think about all the behavior, even the behaviors that I'm trying to make in my life. So for example, if I want to go running in the morning, I'm less likely to do that if it's hard for me to do that and if I'm not motivated to do that. So assuming that I have the motivation to do it, at five o'clock in the morning when the alarm goes off, I might not be motivated to do it. I might be more motivated to roll over. So like that motivation piece is really mm -hmm. tricky, but you can also work on the ability things. So getting all my clothes ready 
the night before. So I get getting my shoes ready the night before, getting my water ready the night before, getting all the things that I need ready the night before so that in the morning, it's not hard for me to get out the door. Right. And you know, the trigger in that case is my alarm going off, saying it's time to wake up and get out the door to go running. Does it hit you with a bowling ball at the same time? Because that's what <laughs> I need my alarm clock to do. I'm trying to think of like a better alarm system that doesn't wake up my wife. Yeah. But if there's something that you want to do, a behavior that you want to adopt or a behavior that you want someone else to adopt, you can think of those three things. And it's really, really helpful to break that down. So like, for example, like what's a behavior that you might want to adopt? Oh God, where do we even start? <laughs> <laughs> way too many. My addiction to sugar. Your addiction to sugar. So that's something you might want to stop. So you might want to make sugar harder to get. You know, you might want to think about decreasing the things that trigger you to see sugar. So if like there's sugar in your home, getting it out of your home. But I have young children, and that's impossible. <laughs> well, there's a fabulous movie from the 70s with the late Dom DeLuise called Fatso. Okay. It hasn't aged well <laughs> from a movie perspective, but he goes on a diet, and he puts like bike chains on his cabinets in his kitchen. And you can see him like just losing his shit over the course of the movie, and he eventually rips them all down and eats all the food. Well, you know, in this case, like breaking habits is somewhat of a different framework than trying to adopt a habit. Mm -hmm. But one thing that BJ Fogg, and I'm just like a disciple, I did an amazing podcast with BJ Fogg that's one of my favorite that I've ever done, but he talks about tiny wait, wait. habits a so lot. So you know him? I've met him, yes. Okay, he's not like of lore from the 1920s or something. He's a no, real he's guy alive. today. No, he's alive. He's a lot. Yeah, he's like a real guy today. Instagram came out of his lab, I think, or Snapchat. Like, Is he the reason why when I buy a suitcase, I get ads for suitcases on Instagram the next day? He's not that reason, but he's perhaps one of the reasons that like we all feel addicted to our phones because a lot of his teachings go into making our technology so persuasive, mm. so, so habit-forming. Some would say addicting, some would say habit-forming. Some would say distracting. There's nuances in the words well, there. Thank but, you, Professor Fogg. <laughs> um, but... If you are looking to adopt a habit, like making it a tiny habit. So like instead of saying, oh, I'm going to do 100 push-ups today, do one. say do one push-up. Uh, instead of saying, oh, I'm going to drink, you know, 100 ounces of water today, drink, drink, one. drink, one, gla <laughs> drink one glass of, <laughs> one water. Ounce of water. Start with that. Just make a tiny habit. And things like that can then be stepping stones to larger habits. So instead of saying, oh, I'm going to walk 10 miles today, walk one mile. Right. Oftentimes, that's how it starts. Because when you do walk that one mile... You start to tell yourself a story mm -hmm. about what that mile means to you, and then two miles doesn't seem so hard. And then there's a really good example of this guy named Jimmy Choi, who has Parkinson's. He was diagnosed when he was 26, young onset Parkinson's, and lives in Chicago, has two kids. And for the first seven to 10 years of his diagnosis, he was in total denial, out of shape, over 200 pounds walked with a cane, mm. and one day, this is going back, I think maybe eight or so years, he was carrying his son, who was an infant, down the stairs and fell down the stairs while he was holding his son. Oh, boy. And fortunately, everyone was okay, okay. but that was like a rock bottom wake up moment for him, and he said, I got to take control. And so he started to walk around his block with a cane, and he would walk around the block. Then we go around twice. Then he started walking a mile, then two miles, and then he said, I'm going to jog. Then he decided to jog. Then he ran a 5K. Then he ran a 10K. Then he ran a half marathon. Then wow. he ran the Chicago marathon. Then he's run, he's run countless marathons. Then his daughter started to take these ninja classes for kids, like American Ninja Warrior. That's he, exciting and terrifying. You know, they have them. My son does them. They're fun. Like, And he started to do that with his daughter and he got really good. He's been on American Ninja Warrior five times. Wow. He's got Parkinson. He's a fan favorite. Amazing story. That's a great story. And, you know, it just starts with walking around the block and you start to adopt a new identity, which is also something that I'm really interested in how people do that as well. Well, I want to get into this consumer psychology angle <laughs> okay. too, because what you do at Charity Miles is akin to a lot of the things that nonprofits do, which is give people a way to give back. If you haven't been directly affected or if you have been directly affected, what can I do? And what you've done is you've given not just individuals, but you've given businesses an opportunity to do something they didn't know they could do. And I really want to lean into the HR benefits, mm -hmm. nerdy, wonky part <laughs> of your company 
how do you pitch this to them? Not just like, oh, you'll have healthier employees who will keep their jobs longer. What's the real pitch when you're in there? Well, fortunately, now it's mostly companies coming to us that are looking for ways to improve their employee well-being, to improve their employee engagement, to improve their CSR, their DEI. This is something that companies are really interested in. And so they're looking for solutions like Charity Miles. And we call this our employee empowerment program, which is a part of what we do. We started it right before COVID, not knowing that there was going to be a pandemic. But Oh, you didn't know? No, we didn't have the foresight, unfortunately. But we had this other feature in the app that allows anybody to create a team with their friends, with their fraternity and sorority, with their running club. And a lot of companies were doing that. And they would reach out to us asking us for different modifications to it or enhancements to it or for us to run reports for them or whatever. So that kind of gave us the inclination that there was a demand for something here. And so I started to learn about, you know, what employers are looking for from employee well-being and engagement. And that's what was it? What are the top lines? Well, they are all looking to improve employee health because they have the inclination that it affects their bottom line. Mm -hmm. I don't think that anybody's really able to measure it, which is a separate question and problem. That's a separate question, yeah. But they all say, and there's studies out there that are, I think everybody quotes from like the same few studies that say that, oh, if you improve employee well-being, it'll save you this much money. I don't think anybody's really nailed that part yet. Right. But, it's the assumption that like less people will be sick and they'll have uh, more time in the office. Yeah, or they'll, they won't be sick. They'll have less time out. Your insurance costs will go down. Productivity goes up. Productivity morale. goes up. Morale. Like, yeah. And that all makes sense. Like, I don't know if you need to measure it. It just makes sense. If people are feeling tired and sluggish and out of shape, they're going to be falling asleep at their desk versus if they're feeling invigorated and healthy and they've got the energy, then they're going to be more productive and they're going to be more creative. They're going to feel better. They're going to feel more confident. It just makes sense. I mean, I go back to retention. If I had to pick one thing, like let's go back to your clients that a year later, has anyone quit? Is there less turnover because of this benefit? Well, it's really hard to say because there's no true A-B study on that right. because they have other benefits that they're running too. So you don't know what benefits kept people, what didn't. Did somebody quit because like they didn't have charity miles? I doubt it. But you know, part of I think- Although of, that would be a great story. <laughs> yeah. Somebody quitting is like, oh, if you don't have charity miles, I'm out the door. It's all the companies out there. Your employees will quit if you don't have they're, charity miles. That's your pitch. <laughs> if you don't do this. But a lot of companies are really into giving back now, which is phenomenal. And we kind of allow them to do both at the same time. I think that if we were pitching them, oh, you're going to have measurable benefits, then that would be a really hard pitch to make with a straight face. But I don't talk about that. I just say that this is something your employees will like, and it's something that you want to do, and we can help you do it. So two questions here. Can you then turn back to these clients of Charity Miles? We call them partners. Partners. Yeah. Okay. And you say, well, because of our app integration with your HR benefits employee morale universe, mm -hmm. You've been able to raise X million dollars for these charities. Well, yeah, but the money's coming from them. Right. So they're the ones who are donating it, but they're able to see like, oh, our employees walked 100,000 miles this year, or our employees walked a million miles, depending on how many employees they have and how But that's good for a brand. Yeah, it's great. I yeah. mean, it's phenomenal. And they, you know, we do spotlights on our partners to showcase the work that they're doing, the causes that they're supporting. And there's a story there. You know, it's, it's all about the story. Like, why does this company want to support Girls Who Code? Or why does this company want to support a rare disease foundation? Like, there's amazing stories there that you can focus on that are, they tell more than like some stat about right. like retention or anything like that. All right, final question before the lightning round. Okay. By the way, this is a lightning round. Okay. <laughs> What's your sniff test on bringing new nonprofits into the platform? Well, I would say they can't promote guns. They can't promote discrimination. We currently have about 60 charities in the app that are all world-class organizations. We started with 10 charities. We're a really small company, and I don't have like the infrastructure to support every charity right. that wants to be in the app. And it needs to make sense for people if they're in Columbus or New Jersey or Italy or wherever. So we want the, the charities in there to be kind of global in scope, if not national in scope. So... That's the way that we've been working. But the only thing that I don't like about Charity Miles, and I really don't like this about Charity Miles, is that every day between like five and 10 charities reach out to us that want to be in the app. And for years, I haven't been able to do anything to support them. A lot of rare disease organizations, small charities, local charities, 
and they're doing important work and we're not set up to help them. But we've been working for the last four years to steer the aircraft carrier so that we can support Mm -hmm. more of these charities. And we're just about to launch a partnership with PayPal, which is going to enable us to do that. Like a legit partnership, not like, hey, use PayPal. Right. So we have a partnership with the PayPal Giving Fund that will enable us to bring on almost any charity that wants to join us, provided they're not like a pro-cancer charity. (laughs) (laughs) It's the Get Cancer Foundation. (laughs) Yeah. We don't want charities that are doing that. We don't want like guns. We don't want charities that discriminate based off of sexual orientation or race right. or anything like that. So, All right. Lightning round. Lightning round. What's your top book? Recommendation for the listeners. Cradle to Cradle. By who? William McDonough. He's an architect and designer. And it talks about how you can go from like waste to fuel and like how you design systems so that instead of something being downcycled, you can upcycle it. And it's a book that changed my life and the way that I see everything. Okay. And Second, if not that, and you're looking for a good read, Once a Runner is a great book. Once a Runner. Yeah. By who? John Parker. All right. We'll tag that in the episode description. All right. Last question. Name one person from your universe who you think would be a great guest on the show. Jimmy Choi. This guy, Barefoot Jake, is the first person to run across the United States barefoot, did it with Charity Miles. Noah Barnes. I think he's 14 now. When he was 11, he walked across the United States with Charity Miles. He has type 1 diabetes. All right, so you have a whole talent roster of people yeah, that should we, be sitting we in that We have got a, a lot of people in our community that would be incredible guests to have on your show. All right. Gene Gerkhoff is the founder of Charity Miles, online at charitymiles.org. If you are a company working HR, this is the site to check out. Get your employees involved, improve morale, and hopefully keep retention. <laughs> Thank right. you so very much. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. That's all for now. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. Tell us what you'd like Matthew to cover in his next episode by leaving a message for us at 855-AUDIO-66, and we might just use it in a future show. Out of Patients is a product of Offscript Health. We are a healthcare engagement company built for patients and caregivers by patients and caregivers. Our executive producers are Matthew Zachary and Andrew McDowell. Our senior producer is Betsy Shepard. Our host is Matthew Zachary. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Betsy Shepard. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscriptnot.com. That's media at offscript.com. For more information, visit offscript.com.